gave back to the directors from USA the confidence that a Western can be a great movie. I went to see uh, Once Upon a Time in the West not knowing what to expect, and all of a sudden, what is this thing? My reaction to the film the very first time I saw it was one of astonishment. Everybody loves Once Upon a Time in the West. I knew this movie would last for, you know, forever. You know anything about a man going around playing a harmonica? Looks like we're shy of one horse. <laughs> you brought two too many. I'm here alone in the hands of a bandit who smelled money. You got yourself into something that's bigger than you are. Sergio Leone once said, I was born in the cinema, almost. Uh, his father was a director of silent movies, um, started working around about 1910. His mother was an actress in silent film who actually appeared, remarkably enough, in the very first Italian Western, a movie called Vampira Indiana, the, va the Indian Vampire, 1914, where she played an Indian princess. He was an only child. He grew up in Rome in the 20s and 30s but kept visiting film sets when his father was working at Cinecittà in Rome, the great, uh, the great studio there, or on location in Naples. So he grew up in the film world of Rome. His father introduced him into the film business, and a lot of his dad's contacts were how Sergio got started. Dunque, io, Sergio Leone, l'ho conosciuto, che era un ragazzo, ero giovane anch'io, che faceva lo script, e batteva la clacchetta. <ride> Quindi ha cominciato. Sergio Leone è uno che ha fatto la bottega, non so come si traduce la bottega in inglese. Si è cominciato da ragazzo, da ragazzo assistendo sul set alla, alla ripresa di un film. A man called uh, Mario Bonard, who was a close friend of Sergio's dad, uh, worked with Sergio Leone on eight films with Sergio as assistant for Mario Bonner, and, and culminating in the last days of Pompeii with Steve Reeves. Quindi negli anni, perché una volta bisognava fare degli anni di, di preparazione prima di fare il regista o il direttore della fotografia, adesso si improvvisa un po' tutto, sono tutti, tutti messi ascesi dal cielo, già pronti, già preparati. E quindi Sergio negli anni ha fatto l'assistenza di altri bravi registi come Mario Soldati, e poi dunque poi lui fece, ah, poi cominciò a fare l'aiuto regista con i film storici romani, che era, fece ehm, fece anche Cleopatra, faceva la seconda unit. Dopodiché tornò con Bonnate per fare gli ultimi giorni di Pompei, sempre un film romano. E in, in questo, durante questo film Bonnate morì e lui finì il film. Il film era gli ultimi giorni di Pompei. Dopo questo film lui cominciò a fare il regista al 100% e, e fece il colosso di Rodi che era anche quello un film storico. So he, go, he gets into the Italian film industry and makes lots and lots of films as an assistant to Italian filmmakers in boom years, the economic miracle years of the 1950s. Simultaneously he gets a lot of experience on Hollywood movies in Rome. So for example Quo Vadis, he was an assistant making the chariot race in Ben-Hur for William Wyler. Sergio slightly overclaimed about uh, Ben-Hur. I mean to he did give some interviews where he claimed he directed the chariots race. The chariot race was directed by Andrew Martin, but Leone was part of the Italian crew who worked at Cinecita on the Antioch Circus. So his training was partly in medium-budget Italian films and also in action sequences of Hollywood films. And I think his training says a lot about where he subsequently went. It's una cosa molto importante che va sottolineata di Sergio. Sergio aveva capito che perché il cinema italiano, il suo cinema, potesse avere un'esplosione nel mondo e nonostante lui amasse e fosse anche costretto a mettere degli attori italiani, gli cambiò il nome, 
e tutti gli attori italiani che hanno lavorato con lui a meno questi dove ero io per esempio perché avevano già attori importanti in 1962 there's a kind of almost a collapse of the Italian film industry Cleopatra has been made in Italy and, made, and, and bombed completely. The Leopard by Visconti had just been made by Titanus Productions and bombed. Sodom and Gomorrah had just been made in Italy and it bombed. And, and uh, the whole, you know, the Italian film industry has always been a stop-go sort of industry, or was then. You have one hit, everyone rushes after that hit and rips it off, and then it goes bust four or five years later, and then they regroup and there's another hit, you know. Well, the great hit in the late 50s was a Hercules film with Steve Reeves, which caused hundreds and hundreds of these sword and sandal epics, so-called, to be produced, of which Sergio, of course, got involved. Um, but then in 62, bust, and the whole of the Italian film industry was like a desert. Um, unemployed technicians, unemployed craftspeople, a very, very depressed industry. And in 64, when Sergio made Fistful of Dollars, he found that trigger that set the entire machine of the Italian film industry going again, because it was one of the most successful films commercially that's ever been made in Italy. I was, I was looking around, I was seeing a desert. Some, sometime there was a, a new film of Antonioni, a new film of Visconti, a new film of Rossellini, but in general, the average was really, wasn't exciting. I much more preferred what was going on in France with the Nouvelle Vague. He kind of came along at the end of a cycle, Westerns had played themselves out, and, and finally on television. Uh, they were very, very popular in the 50s and 60s. I think that's how they got uh, into the uh, European sensibility, become from TV. And basically all the stories of the kind of classic Westerns had been told, and I think his work was an incredible stylization, but also a summary of all the, cl the classic Western myths that we'd seen. Inside of Once Upon a Time in the West are several, I don't know, references to other classic Westerns. He, he took the whole experience of the American West and the American Western and distilled it into a certain kind of romantic view. He, he made us look at our Westerns again and, and try and, you know, and, and get. He loved them and, and loved the, the pieces of the Western almost more than we did. And so he accentuated certain things. Plus, there is a wonderful cynicism that comes out of the politics of the time and out of him that uh, pervades his movies. I was a fan of all Westerns, really. I mean, I sort of grew up seeing Westerns on television and watching dreadful series like The Rifleman, and Branded, and The Virginian, and things like that. And, uh, and then starting going to the pictures and really enjoyed um, cowboy films more than anything. There was a plethora of cowboy films in the 60s. And then around about the mid to the late 60s, we started getting the Italian ones. And having, having grown up on the American model and then seeing the Italian ones, it was, it was quite a surprise. I remember seeing A Fistful of Dollars and being quite shocked by it, you know, because it was so unusual. But I rapidly acquired a taste for them. I've done two movies already. Um, like Omar Seca, The Grim Reaper, and Before the Revolution. And now, after Before the Revolution, I had three years or four years of total silence. I couldn't find the money to do any more movies. I was looking for a gig, impossible to find it. Christmas 1966. We're in the Super Cinema in Rome, which is a huge cinema, and they're showing The Good, The Bad and The Ugly. Leone is in the projection booth, and he's with Dario Argento, the young Dario Argento, who then was a film critic, who loved Leone's films. And Leone liked people who loved his films. And they're chatting in the projection booth. Bertolucci comes in. I said, you went to the fir uh, first day to the first show. I said, yes, because I'm waiting for your movies, and I want uh, to be one of the first ones uh, to see them. But uh, why? So it was like an interrogation. It was becoming like an interrogation at the police station. And I started to be irritated. Mm, I was thinking, oh, what is he doing? Is he fishing for compliments? I said, because in this uh, moment of Italian cinema, I really think you are one of the most interesting, if not the most interesting director in our country. 
why. So, in fact, I wanted to leave. But I said, why? You know why? Because in the Westerns that you see, in general, the horses are shot from the side in profile. And the horses are very beautiful in profile, but it's also very banal. And uh, I like how you shoot the asses of the horses. And I saw that he was very, very curious at that moment. He said, yes. I said, yes, because you put your camera behind the horses. And in fact, like Ford, John Ford did a lot. And you see this solid animal the strength of the animal, the power of the animal. And he looked at me, he did a long silence, a bit like in the editing of his movies, when two characters are looking at each other and you have a close-up, silence, the other close-up, another silence. And then he said, you will write my next movie. Ma perché ti dico subito, io quando ho fatto pugno di dollari, eh, subito dopo ho fatto per qualche dollaro in più e ho finito con, chiamiamola la trilogia, eh, con il buono, il brutto e il cattivo. Io dopo il buono, il brutto e il cattivo non avrei voluto fare più western perché avevo chiuso quel tipo di, di leggenda, quel tipo di storia e, e avrei voluto fare, c'era una volta in America il film che sto finendo adesso. <coughs> Se non che dato che i successi ecco tutti sono pronti eh, a non perdonarli mentre invece l'insuccesso sì eh, quando io andai in america eh, la prima cosa che mi dissero lei ci faccia un altro western e dopo le facciamo fare c'era una volta in america ma per ora ci deve fare un altro western e allora a questo punto nacque l'esigenza di fare un film che era completamente differente dagli altri dagli altri tre e, e nacque l'esigenza di una nuova trilogia che è nata proprio con c'era una volta il west si è svolta con uh, giù la testa sì, e finisce con c'era una volta in america che sono i tre periodi che toccano l'america e le americhe se vogliamo he wants to recapture in Once Upon a Time in the West, the magic of what he felt when he was a child, seeing those vast open spaces of the American Western. But at the same time, he didn't approve of their ideology very much. He thought they were too triumphalist and all about the American way and a man's got to do what a man's got to do, all the, all the ideologies of the American Western. So there's this funny paradox. He loves it to death, but at the same time, he wants to criticize it. So he wanted to make a movie that was a kind of homage to all the Westerns he loved, but turn them around a bit, so they meant something different this time. It was fun, the first meeting, it was fun to meet him again. With Dario Argento, who co-wrote with me the treatment of Once Upon a Time in the West, the title existed already when we started to write. With Dario, uh, who was also, like me, a kind of cinephile, Dario was the Mm, how do you say, deputy uh, movie critics of Paese Sera, a evening newspaper in Rome. And uh, he agreed with me that uh, Sergio was one of the most interesting directors in Italy in the 60s. So we were both excited. So these three film buffs sit in Leone's house in spring 1967 and just watch all their favorite westerns together. You know, The Searchers, Shane, Johnny Guitar, The Magnificent Seven, High Noon, particularly High Noon and Johnny Guitar, The Iron Horse by John Ford, all these films. And they, they just steep themselves in this culture of the Western. One day at the beginning he told me, how did you shoot when you were a child? I said, what do you mean, how did you shoot? Eh, with a gun. Did you shoot cha, 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 like that? Or ah, bam, 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 like that? And what they were doing was something that's very common now, but in 1967 was very uncommon, which is films about films. And in fact, uh, the French philosopher Jean Baudrillard has called Leone the first postmodernist film director for this reason. 
he had uh, his uh, first idea, which was again a movie about uh, a man, like uh, Pugno di Dollari, if it's for dollars and per qualche dollar in più, the second one, and then... Um, and uh, I think that I... Every day, every meeting, I was uh, trying to um, smuggle the idea. It's time now, dear Sergio, the two. <laughs> you face a new challenge. Uh, let's have a woman character in, in your film. At the beginning, he was very resistant. And then one day, he told me, I think, I think you're right. I think um, this time there will be a woman. This, of course, was the first time that Leone had attempted a complex female character in his westerns. Um, in, in the Dollars films, you know, the, the, the female parts are either, I'm afraid, either Madonnas or whores, basically. Uh, a very sort of Mediterranean juxtaposition that in the first one there's a Madonna who's called Marisol, and she has a child called Little Jesus, in case you didn't get the point. <laughs> and, uh, and in others, there's sort of hoteliers and uh, tarts in these strange southwestern towns. So he hadn't really attempted a female part, but she's the entire center of the plot. There's a big long line of us who fell in love with Claudia Cardinale back in the 60s and have never gotten over it. I'm one of those people. I mean, she's just astonishing. Oh, Claudia Cardinale has never been more beautiful in any movie. Or she's the whore with the heart of gold, you know. Every man wants to find the whore with the heart of gold. And, and she, too, becomes this sort of eternal figure at the end when he says, uh, go out and let them look at you, you know. Give them a drink of water. Sergio Leone a long time before. We are very good friends. And, uh, but when he asked me to come to talk about Once Upon a Time in the West, he had no script. He just explained all the film to me that day in his house. And he said, you know, my first idea is that uh, the woman arrives on a train and the camera is very low on the platform and you see the train passing by and stopping and the camera is very low and you see the door of the train or the wagon opening and then you see this gown coming and the, the camera is under the gown and it becomes dark and it's a woman and uh, I'm not sure she's wearing the knickers. That was his first way to accept <laughs> to have a woman in this film. Um, then it was Claudia Cardinale. They say that uh, he was supposed to put the camera low to see that I'm not, I wasn't wearing underwear. This is completely stupid, ridiculous, because <laughs> I never accept to be naked. Nowhere. Because I'm not uh, selling my body to anyone. And uh, Sergio never asked me to do that. I think he saw me like Jill. And uh, for the first time in a Western, the woman has this kind of part, very important. And uh, it was magnificent to be surrounded by actors like uh, Henry Fonda, Charlie Bronson, and uh, Jason Roberts, of course. Then I was surrounded by magnificent actors. Henry Fonda had played Wyatt Earp. Um, he played young Mr. Lincoln for John Ford and had said that playing Mr. Lincoln was to him like playing Jesus Christ. He was so noble. Hank Fonda was the noble American with bright blue eyes and that wonderful princely walk that he had. Sergio Leone asked me to do a film and sent me the script and I just couldn't believe it. And I met him, had lunch with him, and I hadn't seen his early films, so I didn't know Sergio Leone's reputation. And he realized I hadn't seen him, so he arranged for a screening, and I saw 
about three and a half hours of his early films with Clint Eastwood. And one of them involved uh, an actor friend of mine, and uh, I called him, and uh, he said, don't miss it, just go. To hell with the script, just go. You'll fall in love with him, he's marvelous. So I accepted. And in the months before I went, I kept thinking, now, this heavy son of a bitch, how am I gonna? I finally went to a, an optometrist and had uh, contact lenses made to make my baby blues brown. <laughs> and I grew a mustache with a little divot that looked a little bit like the guy that shot Lincoln. I'm trying to look like a <laughs> son of a bitch. <laughs> and I arrive at the studio in Rome and Sergio takes one look at me and says, off. He was buying the baby blues he wanted and I didn't know why until I realized in my opening scene in the film, you see five or six long robe brimmed hat characters that you don't recognize, but just ominous looking, converging from the sagebrush with rifles and handguns. And this terrible moment that you just watched the farm family massacred. And they start to walk towards you, converging towards you, and then the camera switches back to the little boy who's standing there just petrified, watching these people come to him. And then into the foreground of the little boy comes a figure. The camera very slowly is coming around and Sergio Leone had cast me because he could imagine at this moment the audience saying, Jesus Christ, it's Henry Fonda! <laughs> of him, I remember the way he was walking and the way he was moving. It was like slow motion. He was moving in a very strange way, fantastic. The idea of Henry Fonda, I think, was, was, was like a very cynical joke on the part of Leone because he saw what nobody else saw in Fonda, that here was a guy who, although he played endlessly nice, good guys, you know, there was something very cold about Fonda, something very distant about him and that could play a really bad guy. Eddie Fonda, eh, beh, come tutti gli attori americani, sono dei gran professionisti, non c'è nessun problema. Tutti gli attori, lui non parlava inglese, Sergio, e tutti gli attori lavoravano molto volentieri con lui, tutti sono venuti sempre volentieri, infatti lui ha lavorato con dei grossi attori. In my opinion, uh, Charles Bronson is the key to Once Upon a Time in the West. His character is the haunted loner. The man out of nowhere, only taken a step further, he has a past and a story to tell. I suppose there's lots of reasons why Bronson was uh, chosen for that part. I mean, there are stories that, that we're told that other actors were offered the part first, that, that James Coburn was offered the part, that, that Eastwood was offered the part. But, but when you see Bronson in it, you really do think it couldn't have been anybody else. Inside the dusters, there were three men. So? Inside the men, there were three bullets. He was always in a corner, playing with a ball like this all the time. He wasn't speaking to anyone. He was a very mysterious man. Well, another interesting piece of casting was Jason Robards, who was a theater actor, really, as part of a sort of theater acting dynasty. His father had been a theater actor and had worked in the silent movies. So to put him as a rough and ready baddie was actually uh, quite a risky piece of casting. With Jason Robards, fantastic relationship. And in fact, I remember when we did, again, another movie together, uh, Werner Herzog, Fitzgeraldo. He has a great speech to Claudia Cardinelli when they're out building the railroad, and he tells her that, you know, if she goes out there and somebody whacks her in the butt, just ignore it because they deserve it. It's a great moment in the film. And if one of them should uh, patch you behind, just make believe it's nothing. They earned it. Gabriele Fazzetti was um, a well-known matinee idol of Italian cinema in the 1940s, who also had moved into theater work in the 1950s and had become a sort of grand figure in running film festivals and running theater festivals. So he was sort of semi-administrative, grand figure of the Italian cultural scene. And again, for him to appear in a Western was quite interesting. It's like, it's like casting Laurence Olivier in a Western. Was it necessary that you kill all of them? I only told you to scare them. 
People scare better when they're dying. <laughs> and can you tell me what good was your stupid... La parte di modulo l'ho avuta per, per caso, perché era destinata a un altro attore. Il quadratore era in quel momento occupato con il teatro, quindi non poteva accettarla. Tutto lì. Quindi è stato destino. Molti film che io ho fatto sono stati dettati, decretati dal destino. Io ho dato la possibilità ad attori, anche come Salerno, di venire fuori, perché io non ho accettato i motivi. E lui e altri hanno dato a me la possibilità... So at the beginning of the film, you have Woody Strode, John Ford's black actor, who's always very noble, Sergeant Rutledge, um, Pompey in the, in the Man Who Shot Liberty Valance more recently. Well, he's a killer in this, a ruthless killer with a sawed-off shotgun with a, with a guard around the trigger that makes it look like a John Wayne rifle. So you've got the connotation of Woody Strode, and it surprises you. He doesn't normally play people like that. Jack Elam, who'd played the second baddie from the left in countless Hollywood movies. You remember him forever for, for that sort of few minutes where he's sitting at the station with a fly in his beard. There is a story, um, which may even be true, that uh, Leone approached Clint Eastwood, Eli Wallach, and Lee Van Cleef for Once Upon a Time in the West and said, I want you to be in my film. And they all went, oh, great, we're all going to be the, 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 you know, the main guys like before. And he goes, no, you're going to be killed in the first five minutes. It was a tremendous idea because he's making a conscious break, if the story's true, with everything he'd done before. They are the true example of where a face is a landscape. Jack Elam sitting there trying to get the fly in the barrel of the gun, you know, is, is, is wonderful. Uh, Woody Strode with the water plopping in the hat. And of course, the best part of it is they get shot down. 